Well, greetings. Thought I would come up here to the church and uh, share with you today as we're uh, doing our Bible study. Um, still looking into the book of Acts and uh, seeing now some of the stories of Paul, uh, who kind of uh, fills the remainder of our our <coughs> lessons in the in the book of Acts. Um, and so uh, we'd like to uh, just get started with a word of prayer. God, we give you thanks for our day. We give you thanks for this opportunity to study and to just think of your word and um, mostly in the midst of a, of a, of a book that has a, a little more of a historical accounting to it as it looks at uh, your servant Paul and the work that he did in expanding the, uh, the growth of the church, uh, spreading it to, to places va uh, far and wide um, outside of the area of Jerusalem. And uh, so we just like to ask that you bless us in our time to, to hear this and to study together and to think about uh, the words that uh, have been written here for us to uh, ponder upon. Thank you, God, for all that you do, and thank you for this church and for the work that's done here. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we'll start with uh, chapter 20 today. Remember, we are uh, still in the midst of Paul's third missionary journey where he is still traveling um, in a variety of different places. Uh, still looking into the Gentile world is where he's at and, um, uh, you know, still has connections with the Jewish uh, believers, uh, uh, the Jewish church as well. I mean, because part of the key base is going to still be Jerusalem uh, for the way um, Although Paul's kind of base of operations has always been Antioch of Syria. But um, yeah, I mean, Jerusalem is sort of the, the highlighted place of where we want to look at. But Paul is far from there at this point. Um, again, he's on his third missionary journey. He is, um, has been in Macedonia and a few other places. That's where he's uh, left here. He's, he left because of the uh, riot in Ephesus. Um, and some of the things going on there. So if we begin chapter 20, uh, we hear these words. And a lot of what we do when we're looking at the book of Acts is there are intermixed stories of the work of what Paul is doing, but there's also just kind of this um, geographical, historical um, commentary that's going on within here too that, that doesn't require a lot of explanation it's just that it's good to hear some of the places and, and watch how Paul is traveling and think about the fact that, uh, you know, being on foot and also being in ship, that this is taking months and months and months of, of work and travel and, and going from place to place. And uh, it's, just, it's not like today where we can hop in a car and go from one city to the next or we can travel by plane. I mean, if Paul had, pl had a plane, he could have just gone anywhere, couldn't he? Uh, but he's traveling by ship. And even the ships there are not as speedy as what the, the larger ships there are now. I mean, cruise liners can travel for uh, hundreds of miles in, in, in a matter of days and, and just be where they need to be. And so, you know, ports of call for him are going to be far, few and far between uh, as he travels around. And so we want to just uh, be mindful of those things as we're looking into the Scripture. Oh, there, there's some interesting little tidbits of stories within here. Of, of some of the work that Paul does, not just only his preaching, but uh, a couple of miracles and uh, just highlighting some of the people that Paul is connecting with as well. And so it's kind of interesting to always look at the book of Acts and see what's going on. And um, I, I always want to say that uh, there's times I can't pronounce all the names of these people. Um, it's that they have different names. And so I uh, want you to be aware of that as we continue to go on. So starting at verse tw at chapter 20, verse 1. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. While there in Macedonia, uh, remember we're looking at a time period. We just, uh, you know, it doesn't tell us how long it took to get from there to there. And, uh, while he was there, though, he encouraged the believers in all the towns he passed through. Then he traveled down to Greece, where he stayed for three months. Now, see, here's a, a good period of time for us to think about. I mean, what's that, about 90 days? So that gives him plenty of time to spend time with, uh, with people, uh, to go into the synagogue. Remember, he did that every Sabbath, it said. And so um, there's a, plenty of time for him to preach in those communities. Um, then he stayed, traveled to Greece where he stayed for three months. He was preparing to sail back to Syria 
when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life, so he decided to return through Macedonia. Several men were traveling with him. They were Sopater, son of Phyrus from Berea, um, Aristarchus from and uh, Sedun, Sedun, Secundus, Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy, and uh, Tychius from uh, Troph and Troph Trophimus from the province of Asia. And they went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. After the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia. We've heard of Philippi. And five days later, joined them in Troas where we stayed for a week. Now, I'm not sure the distance between the two, but, you know, imagine he's sailing on the ship for five days just to get from one point to the next to uh, to interact with some of his uh, compatriots, we might call them, his um, uh, people he is working with to uh, expand or to spread the, uh, the work of, of Christ. Um, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers, uh, the memories in Troas, um, to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until up until midnight. The upstairs room where he met was lighted with many flickering lamps. And I like what it says in uh, the beginning of verse 9. It says, and Paul spoke on and on. <laughs> um, it, it just continued on. It just Paul's speaking and, and sharing. And Adele, I mean, it's, 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 it seems like that's what they wanted to hear. And, and you know, you hear those days, even with Jesus, that, that, that he could have these large, these long messages. And people just were entranced and enjoyed them so much. And so Paul must be the same way. But it says that Paul spoke on and on. Um, and while he did, a young man named um, uh, Eutychus, sitting in the window sill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell asleep, and he dropped three stories to his death below. It was interesting. There was one um, uh, commentary that says that uh, Paul's preaching went on for hours. It was midnight, and the lamps in the room uh, were lit. And it may have been that these lamps had given off fumes and heat and could have caused the drowsiness. Who knows? Uh, but it must have been a long time that Paul was preaching. And this young fellow just fell out of the window. Um, and then Paul ran down, bent over him, and took him into his arms. What does Paul say? Don't worry. He's still alive. He performed this miracle. He raised this man from the dead. Because you know he was in this moment. It says he was. But Paul says, no, he's alive. And then what does Paul do? They all gathered back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. I mean, as if nothing happened. Paul continued to talk to them until dawn. Remember, when, when this happened, it was about midnight it, it was talking about. Um, and then he talks till dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Uh, in verse 13, Paul went by land to um, Asos, where he arranged for us to join him and that some of these traveling folks who are, who are working in here, and it's possible that this is where Luke is trying to recount some of these things that he has become part of this group that's traveling, uh, and where he traveled by ship. Uh, he joined us there, and we sailed together to um, Mytilin, and the next day we sailed past the island of Chios. The following day we crossed to the island of Samos, and a day later, we arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of the Pentecost. Paul wanted to be a part of one of these huge festivals that's going on, and as part of his tradition, as part of who he was as a Jewish person, too, to be a part of these things. Um... But when he landed at uh, Miletus, he s sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus asking them to come and meet him. When they arrived, he declared, You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came from, to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. And we're going to hear, we'll hear a lot more about this if we tackle some of his letters to many of these churches to hear how he is uh, combating certain issues that are, 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 are sort of um, um, 
a difference between Jews and Gentiles and how they want to, uh, a disagreement, we might say, and how they are to um, enact or, or be a part of this faith. And Paul says it's got to be having faith. You've got to turn from sin and turn to God. Um, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me there, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in the city in city after city, that jail and suffering lie ahead. Paul knows what's going to happen to him, doesn't he? He knows that something is going to take place. It's going to keep him eventually from being able to continue to spread the word of God. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And that's Paul's mission, is to share the grace of God, to share it with other people, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the same good news we are to share with others that we might come in contact with. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will never will ever see me again. Um, you know, Paul knows that there's going to be times that he's not going to see any more of these people he has touched base with at times, um, that he's going to be either imprisoned uh, or, 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 or he'll be dead, you know, be martyred uh, for something, for this. I declare that today I've been faithful, and if anyone suffers eternal death, it is not my fault, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Uh, so guard yourself and God's people, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elder. So he's sort of leaving people behind and, and sharing with people that you guys are in charge of these particular churches that we've started, these areas that we've expanded into. Um, you're kind of going to take over and and and... And now you're going to share the message. You're going to lead these people. You're going to be the people who oversee the flock that is there in the midst of all of this. Um, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. I mean, I guess he's saying that some will will want to have that popularity, will want to um, engage in some some sense of being the ones that people are flocking to, that it becomes more about them than it does the message, but they'll use the message as, as part of that undertaking to, to gain some popularity if they can. And that they, he says, watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day and in many tears for you. So there gives us some idea of how long he's been working. At least three years he's been doing this with these folks. And so now they've been able to kind of take over a little bit. It's as if you know, he has his kind of disciples in a way, doesn't he, that he's sharing this with so that they can begin to, to, to do the outreach and the work and the discipleship that needs to be done, that they become sort of the preachers, the pastors, the whatever of the churches in this time. Or he calls them elders. And now I entrust you to God and the message of grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who are with me. Uh, and I have, because remember Paul was a tent maker. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. There's a wonderful uh, context for us when we think about giving sometimes is it is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, when he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. And they all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he had said that this would be that they would never see him again. And they had escorted him down to the ship. So they got this last opportunity to say goodbye to Paul because more than likely they are not going to see him again. They knew it. Paul knew it. And, and through Scripture, we can know that as well, too. Chapter 21 um, says this. After saying farewell to the Ephesian elders, uh, we sailed straight to the island of Kos. The next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Patara. Then we boarded a ship sailing for Phoenicia. We sighted the island of Cyprus, passed it on our left, and landed at the harbor of Tyre and Syria, where the ship was to unload its cargo. We went ashore and found local believers and stayed there for a week. They're gonna, they've landed here. 
the ship needs to unload and you know, I don't know if they're good on another ship or the same one, if it's loading back. I, mean, I don't know how long all of that took place, but if, if that's sort of what we're looking at, it took a week to load and unload, to unload and load a ship in a certain port. Um, we sighted the out uh, against and we went ashore, found the believers and stayed with them for a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go on to Jerusalem. Uh, there's these rumors of what might happen to Paul if he does go to Jerusalem. And remember, he had, had sort of sensed it earlier, and now he's got other people, again, who were sort of sensing that same thing um, uh, within that, within the, that the Holy Spirit's calling them and saying, don't go to Jerusalem. When we returned to the ship at the end of the week, the entire congregation, including women and children, left the town and city, the city, and came down to the shore with us. There we knelt, prayed, and said our farewells. Then we went aboard, and they returned home. The next stop after leaving Tyre was uh, Ptolemus. There we were greeted by the brothers and sisters and stayed for one day. The next day we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men uh, who had been chosen to distribute food. If we think about that, that must be the Philip earlier on in Scripture where we had Stephen and many of those who were chosen to uh, to do some of that work. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. Several days later, a man named Agabus, who had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and handle with it, hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. Uh, when we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Uh, and again, here's this prophecy of what's going on. But he said, why all this weeping? You are breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed in Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. When it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Paul at this point has no fear. He's not worried about what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He knows that something might, but he's not fearful of it because he knows what he's doing. He knows that he's, he will be with the Lord because he's been doing the Lord's work. After this, we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us and took us to the home of uh, Manasseh, um, Mason, a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went to meet with James and all the elders of the Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of all the things God had accomplished through the, to the Gentiles through his ministry. After hearing this, they praised God, and then they said, You know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they all followed the law of Moses very seriously. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on the laws of Moses. They've heard you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly fear, hear that you have come because they're, they're worried that what, what they hear Paul's coming. That's when this whole deal is going to take place where they're going to kind of try to capture him and, 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 and do something to him because they think he's, almost in a sense, breaking the law, and that Jewish law. Um, and, and that gives them right to... Uh, not only confront him, but to charge him against the law of Moses. Here's what we want you to do. We have four men who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony, paying, for the, paying them to have their heads ritually shaved. Then everyone know that the rumors are false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. As for the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in the letter. They should abstain from eating food from, to idols, from consuming blood or meat of the strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Verse 26, so Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. They had already started purification rituals, so he publicly announced the date when their vows would end and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, men of Israel, help us. 
This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and again tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. Which in a way, he really doesn't, does it? He just says, he, he, he was just been talking that for the Gentiles and the Jews in those areas that, you know, it's not necessary to have this circumcision anymore. It's about having faith. It's about believing in God. It's about uh, being baptized in the name of Jesus. And that, in a sense, is what you're called to do now. That is your symbol. That is your reaction. That is what you're called to be doing as you uh, are beginning to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, he speaks against the temple and even defiles the holy place by bringing in Gentiles. For earlier that day, they had seen him in the city of uh, Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. Uh, which wouldn't have been right in any way. The whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowds. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. <laughs> Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress, because there he'd be almost protected in a way. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him up on their shoulders to protect him. And the crowds followed behind him shouting, kill him, kill him. As Paul was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? The commander asked, surprised. Aren't you the Egyptian who led the rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? No, Paul replied. I am a Jew and a citizen of Tarsus and Cilicia, which is an important city. Please let me talk to these people. And the commander agreed, so Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the people to be quiet. Soon, deep silence to envelop the crowd, and he addressed them in their own language, Aramaic, which is impressive that Paul knows these various languages. But remember, Paul is a very well-trained man, and so he does know these languages, and he can share with other people um, in the midst of all this. So he begins to speak. So we're going to do chapter 22 and stop it uh, at the end of the chapter 22. Um, actually, we'll stop it probably at about uh, verse 30. Maybe we'll go through. Brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater because I guess they didn't think that he could speak in their language. Uh, then Paul says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As a, as a student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. And I, was per I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify to this. For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. As I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you were persecuting. The people with me saw the light but didn't understand the voice speaking to me. And so I asked, what should I do, Lord? The Lord told me, get up and go to Damascus and there you'll be told everything you were to do. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led by the hand to Damascus by, the, by my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law and well regarded by the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive, regain your sight. And that very moment, I could see again. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear him speak. For you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Have your, have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, Hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. 
But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that, I, that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was, complete, I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. He's sharing about his call, isn't he? The crowd listened and Paul said that word, the word. Then they all began to shout, away with such a fellow. He isn't, he isn't fit to live. They yelled through all their coats and tossed handfuls of dust into the air. The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. He wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. And when they tied Paul down to lash him, Paul said to the officers standing there, it is, is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't been tried? He pulls the Roman citizenship card again, doesn't he? It's not about what the people there want. It's about what are his rights as a citizen of Rome. When the officer heard this, he went to the commander and said, what are you doing? This man is a Roman citizen. You know, they can't, they can't punish him for what the Jews want. He has to go in front of uh, the laws, the legal officers, the legal courts in Rome in order to, be, to, to state his case and share what's going on. So the commander went over and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, Paul said. I am too, the commander uttered, and it cost me plenty. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. The soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly withdrew when they heard he was a Roman citizen, and the commander was frightened because he had ordered him bound and whipped as afraid about what Paul might say and get them in trouble. The next day, the commander ordered the leading priest in the session with the Jewish high council. He wanted to find out what was troubling, what, was tr what the trouble was about. So he released Paul to have him stand before them. So now they're going to be, uh, he's going to be standing in front of the uh, Jewish council for his trial, um, not in front of, and so it's, it takes it out of the, the Roman courts or at least out of the hands of that Roman soldier commander so that he doesn't get in any kind of trouble. So there's a little bit of our stories. Paul's in Jerusalem now, and uh, he's going to have to confront his accusers in this and the next time we, we chat. And so I um, hope you um, got a little bit out of that today. And um, we will see you again next week.